The diner sat at smaller tables in groups of two, three, or more. Like the main table, the diner's tables had been fashioned from coral, with animated centerpieces enchanted to resemble seaweed drifting in an underwater current. Monsters are a key element of adventuring in Dungeons & Dragons, no less in the world of Eberron. In this library of Kornberg, we're reopening the Monster Manual, and now approach the last few entries, starting with A. In this third installment of Eberron's Monster Manual A to Z, we're covering two of the last three entries under A. As a reminder of how these episodes work, for each monster entry, first we establish the baseline of how the monster is within the current D&D edition, with a little rundown on how they changed over previous editions as well. Then we'll look over how those monsters were customized for the world of Eberron, including where they can be found, their relations to other creatures and peoples, and remarkable NPCs, if there are any. I'll also briefly rate sources within Eberron books with information about the monster's place in the world, so you know which books to pick up if you're looking to expand your own knowledge and use the creatures as a focus for an adventure or whole campaign. Animated objects are pretty self-explanatory creatures based just on the name. They are objects that have become animated through magic or other means. In theory, they could be any object, but the current edition has three specific forms, an animated armor, a smothering rug, and a flying sword. Animated objects may be purpose-built by Arcanists, but are also brought to life by fey creatures. Though not in the Monster Manual, Animate Objects is a somewhat related 5th level transmutation spell in the player's handbook. You can't create any of the previous three animated objects with the spell, but instead it has its own stat block based on the size of the generic object. Animated Objects have varied greatly through editions and early editions from basic through AD&D 2nd edition, there were no entries in the Monster Manual or equivalent at all. Instead, they were the sole purview of a level 6 priest or cleric spell, depending on the name of the class in that edition, that generated temporarily animated creatures. Stats were not even fully codified. Suggestions were included in the spell's text, but exact adjudication was left to the DM. The first appearance of the spell was included in the first ever D&D supplement, Greyhawk. So as early as you could get other than actually being in the original booklets. In 3rd and 3.5 edition, the spell was changed as D&D as a whole was systematized. The creatures created by the animated object spells needed exact rules and thus received an entry into the monster manual, the spell could then reference. The art shown in the Monster Manual is an animated candelabra, but the stats are generic, with seven variations for the seven different size categories of that edition. While the exact fifth edition forms of animated objects didn't appear in the Monster Manual or any of the other monster books or adventures I could find, there is a magic item, specifically a magic rug, that is remarkably similar to the Rug of Smothering. The item appeared in Complete Arcane and was the ironically named Rug of Welcome, which could be set in a location and attack anyone who doesn't speak a passcode set by the owner, remarkably similar to the function of the Rug of Smothering. Fourth edition saw a lot of changes. There was no animated object spells exactly, and no monster manual entry for the objects themselves either. Eventually, Dungeon Magazine, number 211, had an adventure called 
Glitter Dust, which did feature a low level generic animated object, but only for small sized objects animated by fey creatures. They did feature custom attacks based on the type of animated object, which was a new feature of the game. The adventure also featured an animated suit of armor at medium size. There were also two other iterations of the animated armor concept in 4th edition, the Infernal Armor Animus and the Haunted Armor Animus, differing mostly in challenge and the theming of the source of animation. These appeared in the Monster Manual 2 and Revenge of the Giants, respectively. So while there is a fair history of animated objects in D&D overall, there's not a lot of specific to Eberron within any publications. The animate object spell does appear in the Artificer Infusion or Spell List in 3rd and 5th editions respectively, but that's basically it, unless I miss something non-specific or obscure. No flying swords, animated rugs, or specific animated armors, or any real mentions of anything more generic. However, it is quite easy to conjecture the placement of animated objects based on just their functions in the game and the animated object spell being available to artificers. And that is with the dragon marked houses. It is quite likely that House Caneth is behind the majority of permanent animated objects. Since a reasonably high level of magic is needed to cast a spell these would be a low volume product and would likely be contracted through House Medani or the Defenders Guild of House Denith as rentals for personal protective services when human personnel are not appropriate. Onk eggs are a large insectile creature that burrows through the ground, bursting out to catch prey. The creature is omnivorous, getting a good proportion of their nutrients from processing food found as they dig, but they do require a more meaty meal from time to time. Most oncake prefer farmland as that makes their life easy with access to rich, easy to dig earth and easy to catch livestock. Primarily armed with massive mandibles, oncakes are also able to generate acidic bile from deep within their digestive tract and spray that out as another weapon, one best avoided by their foes. Onk eggs are depicted as a creature that looks somewhat between a mantis and an ant with a yellowish brown chitin. According to the encounter tables of Xanathar's Guide to Everything, they can be found in forests and grasslands, alone, or in fairly small groups. The Onk Egg goes back quite far in the history of D&D, first appearing in early 1977 in Dragon Magazine number 5, and then again later that year in the first ever monster manual for AD&D. The first iteration of the creature differed from the modern monster. First was the spelling. It was A-N-H-K-H-E-G. Later editions dropped the H after the N. The original Onkeg was described as worm-like in its eating habits, with earth processing as its primary food source. Despite the worm-like description, the physical description was said to appear a lot like a praying mantis, long and tall. Not much was changed in 2nd edition AD&D, other than the spelling being updated to the modern standard. It showed up first in the Loose Leaf Monsters Compendium Volume 2, and then it was moved along to the first Monstrous Manual book when that arrived a few years later. The art depicts them a little chunkier and once in color, showed them as yellowish. Third edition continues with them in the first Monster Manual. The chunkier form continued with more ant-like features added to their makeup. A deep brown coloration option was also added to go alongside the classic yellow. Behavior-wise, there is a bit of focus on Onkegs being solitary creatures, and that even if a few were found within the same region, that they would not cooperate, 
However, it did say that they weren't violently territorial either. Fourth edition relegated the Ankeg to the second monster manual, but the form and function of the monster remained mostly the same. There was no mention of a yellow coloration though, and the solitary nature was completely dropped. Instead, they are noted as usually found as mating pairs, alongside the new hatchlings, which appeared in the book as well. The Ankeg of Eberron are visually and behaviorally more or less identical to the beasts you might find in the Forgotten Realms. There's nothing to indicate that they're anything but a naturally occurring predator, though they do have some connection to the Dalkir Lord Valara, the Crawling Queen. It appears that she uses Ankegs more as a base for flesh crafting, a starting point, not her end goal. It has been suggested that she may have created an Ankeg that can burrow through space-time itself and ambush victims via teleportation. Ankegs can be found on pretty much all of the non-icy continents. There are attestations of their presence in the Talentic Plains, parts of Ryadra and Sirkarn, and parts of Zendrik too. It might also be possible that Arganesson has an Ankeg population under the control of the dragons, based on that Zarkon, the blue dragon, on having a tunneling team of trained Ankeg as part of his army force. The Ankeg of Eberron seem to be drawn to hot lands, both jungles and deserts, more so than their core d, &D counterparts. Talanta, the born and seer Karn frontier, and Zendrik's vast jungles and deserts have all had Ankegs appear in their encounter tables. There is also a note that Ankegs are attracted to warm places to nest, like the inside of Hanbalani monuments. So this behavior and existences in dry plains, jungles, and deserts may be related even though there is no direct textual confirmation of a larger attraction to heat. So this is the segment of the series where we look over which Eberron books and other sources can be used to best inform you about the creatures in Eberron. Then look at any material that was once canon, but no longer is. In this case, there's not any of this apocrypha to cover, and the sources are all quite, let's say, thin. So I'll dispense on rating them as they are more or less just all single line mentions. Dragons of Eberron. Where the dragon Zarkon's trained Ankegs are mentioned. Explorer's Handbook. Ankegs are in the encounters at a quarry monolith encounter table. Secrets of Sarlona. Ankegs are included in the Morakush Underground Encounter Table. Secrets of Zendrik. Ankegs are mentioned as a possible encounter in the Sand Trap Room in the Desert Canyon. Five Nations. Again, we have the creatures just mentioned in the Western Talenta Encounter Table. Exploring Eberron. The largest entry, but still just mentioned in relation to the Dalkir Valara. RPGA adventure, Noble Savages. Ankegs appear in the encounter table for near a Zendrik jungle temple. So these two monster manual entries are a good example of approaches to use for monsters that haven't been particularly fleshed out as distinct parts of Eberron, but still ensure they feel like living parts of the setting. Using the existing material to make logical steps of tying animated objects with the Dragonmark houses, or taking the scant evidence from the books and connecting it to surmise that Eberron's Ankegs are especially attracted to heat. Or you can also approach things like Keith Baker did in Exploring Eberron, taking the creature in a brand new direction that entirely makes sense, like Valaris on cakes.
And with that, we can close the book and return it to the Kornberg Library. Next time that we return to the Monster Manual, we'll be finished with the A's. I'll aim to do that next one before too long. For the next video I'm actually going to produce, I feel like covering some more Eberron miniatures, but haven't chosen which ones to do yet. So stay tuned to find out. I do also feature miniatures on the channel's Instagram most weeks, and the channel is on other social media as well. Links are in the description.